Hi everybody, really good to see you here. Hope everybody's ready to get started. Sorry for the slight delay while we just let everybody in. It's wonderful to see you. So I'm Zella Compton. I'm the editor of Marine Industry News. I've been looking after MIN for about a year now. Um, it's going from strength to strength with entertaining, relevant and lively selection of news. So that's my little plug for the day, even though you're already here. So, but anyway, I um, feel very, very privileged to work on Marine Industry News, especially with the team um, that I work with. We publish a whole lot of flexible content from um, the horrific story earlier this week about the cattle stuck in transit to Pip Hair and Marinda Meron's awesome Vendee Globe experiences. So yeah, we, we like to do things that we think are, that will interest our readers. And so we're really, really delighted to start our Women in Marine series. So what this is, is we've set this up to hear from women who work in the marine world. We want to explore their roles, uh, their challenges, their futures, and help to build a brilliant network which we can all call on when needed. So this is the first online seminar of what we hope will be many. So I'm gonna run through a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I think there's going to be about 30 of us in the call, which is great. We're recording the seminar to publish on Marines um, Industry News' channels, social media channels in the future. If you want to see everybody that's here and you're not so used to Zoom, you can click on the sort of grid icon in the top right hand of your screen and put on the gallery view so you can see everybody's faces. We're going to hear from Lauren Mead at Team O Marine Safety, and she's got an amazing story of how she had an idea for a product and then developed the technology and took that to market with her team. I mean, it's just incredible what she's done. But before we do that, we're gonna hear from Suzanne at Barton Marine, who has joined us as our sponsor for our session of Women in Marine today. So she's gonna say a few words and then we're gonna come back to me again. Over to you, Suzanne. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I know everybody's busy, so fitting this into a schedule isn't always easy, but it's always worth it. And uh, Bart Marine's always trying to support women in marine events, but this one's really special because I have so much respect for people who come up with an idea and you know get it produced or produce it themselves, manufacture it, and take it to market. And Lauren's going to tell us all about her success story. So uh, we're very pleased to sponsor today. And I'd like to thank uh, Marine Industry News for all their help to get it organized. And that's it from me. Thank you, Suzanne. That's great. So a little bit more of housekeeping. As Lauren's going through what she's done and her incredible story so far, her journey, if you have any questions that come up, that's great. If you use the chat function at the bottom of Zoom, if you click on chat, put your questions within there, and then when Lauren's finished, we cannot go through those questions. So we'll do it via that kind of curated way. That would be really useful. I'd like, um, if you have got a Marine Industry News mug, if you received one, if you could just hold it up to your camera so we could take a quick snapshot of it. I'm hoping several of you receive them in time. Lauren's got her own version with Min handily done on it beautifully. Look, there it is. So if we can all hold up our mugs and then on, oh, it, yours is a beautiful mug with those spirals on. It's lovely. Anyway, if we all just say cheers to Min and then we can do a snapshot on the count of three. One, two, three. That would be brilliant. Thank you very much. So that just leaves me to say, over to Lauren and um, everybody else. If we can stay on mute, use the chat function for any questions and sit back and enjoy. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Zella. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to start by saying thank you to Barton Marine for sponsoring uh, the talk today. It's uh, there's more and more women in the marine industry every year, and there's a lot of us doing a lot of different roles, different parts of the industry. So it's really interesting to me to kind of listen to everybody's different stories and I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone else who comes in the next few weeks. So um, yeah, my name's Lauren. I'm one of the co-founders of Timo Marine. Um, Timo Marine is a life jacket business in Southampton. Um, you might have seen us online. We do quite a lot of work with YouTube sailing channels or possibly maybe one of our life jackets hanging on the wall of a chandlery. Um, we're stocked with people like Force 4 and quite a lot of the independent chandleries across the UK. So my talk today is going to be about how a real life tragedy was the impetus to start this business with my brother, Oscar. And I'm just going to share my screen now, actually, so that we can look at something a bit more interesting. Can everybody see that? Okay, good. Okay, 
so um, I'm going to go over in a minute why Timo life jackets are a bit different from other life jackets you might already own and wear and go sailing in. Um, but I'm not really going to go into the details of the system because what today's talk is really about is more about ideas. Um, how ideas come about, how to know when you've got a good idea um, that could be a commercially successful business in the future or an idea that could even change the world or maybe save somebody's life. So Timo's story really started in uh, 2011. I was sailing that year on a DK46 called Dark and Steamy that was kept in Hamble. Um, and we were doing the Rourke Morgan Cup. It's a race that goes from Cowes over to Cherbourg in France and then back again. And this photo is actually taken from the start of that race. I'm the little blue hat about four people back from the bow. Um, and the forecast for this race was that it was going to be a really rough night. Um, we were expecting pretty bouncy weather and we were quite a young team. So we were all pretty nervous uh, going into this as the night kind of came on and we were heading out into the channel um, and the wind was just picking up. Um, we were going upwind with a reef in and I was sitting on the rail, as you can see, every one of us in full bow weather gear um, and clipped in next to my teammates. So the wind was just building and building and um, I'm sure lots of you are offshore sailors or you've been offshore in these kind of conditions before. It was just that sort of night where the rain was coming at you so hard, it was stinging your skin when it hit your face. So it was, it was really pretty grim. Um, and in the middle of all of this, we heard that one of the competitors who was somewhere nearby in the dark near us was experiencing a terrible problem. We didn't know exactly what was going on, but we could hear a mayday call coming over the VHF um, and we knew that something bad was unfolding. And as the sun came up in the morning, we got more details and it turned out that the skipper on one of the other boats had gone over the side whilst he'd been tethered on with his life jacket and he drowned. This was an experienced sailor, someone who'd done a lot of sea miles. He'd done all the right things. He was using a safety tether and wearing a life jacket. He'd gone forwards onto the bow to help secure a sail. Um, and in the rough weather, a wave had washed him over the leeward side of the boat, he'd gone under the guardrails and he'd been dragged through the water. So even though his crew knew that he was there and they immediately started to slow the boat down to try and recover him, they couldn't get their skipper back in time. So obviously this was really awful news. The whole fleet was just, the mood in the, in the marina that morning was so somber. Everybody was really struck by what had happened. I mean, when you go off, kind of offshore sailing at the weekends, you know that there's a risk there, but you don't seriously expect to come back one less across the fleet. Um, and particularly in this case, the sailor had actually used the safety kit that we'd all been advised to wear. So there was this extra layer of how could this happen and what really, what really happened? Um, and so after a while, the details about the accident came out and, and it turned out the problem was with the kit. Um, I'm not gonna go into it too much, but Essentially, when you're wearing a life jacket with an integrated deck harness, you take your safety tether and you clip on on the front, sort of around your, your waist. Um, and the risk with that is that if you fall over the side and your boat's moving forwards, you're going to be towed forwards, face down through the water. Um, and even if you're a really fit person, very strong, if the boat's doing more than a couple of knots of forward motion, you're just not going to be able to turn yourself up the right way or even lift your head clear of the water. So that's exactly what had happened in this situation. Um, a few days later, I was at home and I was talking about this accident with my dad and my brother. Um, we're all sailors in my family, so we all really understood how this happened and actually how easy it is as well to go over the boat, over the side. Um, a strong wave can just obviously take you off your feet and the, you, you're going where the water's gonna take you. Um, and my brother just had one of those light bulb moments where he just said something really simple and he just said, well, your life jacket should turn you face up in that situation. Um, and that sounds really simple, but it actually was radically different to what other life jackets could offer at that time. So now I should probably tell you a little bit about my brother. This is Oscar. Um, let me see if I can give us that away. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is Oscar. This photograph is taken when he's 18 years old. He was just crossing the finish line of the O-Star race. And this is a single-handed race that goes from Plymouth um, across the Atlantic to Newport in Rhode Island. Um, Oscar's always had a, a Vendée Globe dream. He still does, to be honest. 
um, to this day. And often on tea break at Timo, uh, we'll be talking about life jackets and then he'll direct the conversation to look at some open 60 that's for sale and tell me how he really wants to go around the world on that. So we were, we were all sailors um, and Oscar decided when he was about 16 that he really wanted to do the O-Star race. Uh, somehow he persuaded our parents to let him do it and somehow even more remarkably he persuaded the race organizers to let him do it as well even though he was actually underage at the time that he applied and he turned 18 and then did the race uh, straight away um, and during this crossing um, he was wearing a life jacket from a, a high-end uh, brand name, a name we'd all recognize. Um, but after about 10 days at sea, he said it was so uncomfortable, the weight on the back of his neck and just the backache it gave him, that he stopped wearing it. Um, and instead, he tied a sail tie around his waist and used that uh, as a sort of rudimentary deck harness, which he then clipped his safety tether to. And it was probably about halfway through the race um, that a really big wave came along and washed him down the deck um, against this sail tie, which obviously is just a, a piece of fabric, really not supposed to hold your body weight. Um, and the only thing that ended up keeping him on the boat was that he ended up with a leg either side of one of the stanchions. So if it hadn't been for him just washing into that by pure luck, really, he'd have gone over the side of the boat um, and we possibly would have a very different story. And he didn't tell us, my parents or myself, that story for quite a long time after the race. But the point was, he kind of was building up this experience as an end user, um, realizing that life jackets were just not really that great. They, the principle is really good, but it wasn't meeting uh, what sailors actually needed and something that you would just want to wear to keep yourself safe. So all of this experience in combination with the accident that had happened in the Morgan Cup tragedy, uh, was starting to take the initial idea about um, being towed face down and face up in the water and take it from just a, a rough idea of, oh, this would be good if we could make something that did this through to, okay, how are we going to design this? Um, and my father actually gets huge credit here for sort of booting the business into life. Um, after that initial discussion, my dad, uh, who's also a sailor, had gone away and done some product research. Um, as a sailor, you know, he's worn life jackets as well. He really understands their shortcomings. Um, and so he went and did a little bit of patient research and realized that nobody was thinking about this problem. None of the existing life jacket companies were offering a solution to the issue. And we didn't know of any of them who were trying to design a solution either. Um, and he really pushed Oscar um, and I into starting the business. So we had an idea of what we wanted our product to do. Um, we didn't really know how we were going to achieve it. So Oscar just finished um, his degree at Southampton Solent University in naval architecture. Um, and the challenge kind of fell to him. We basically said, design a solution to this. Um, that's obviously a pretty big challenge, but Oscar's up for it. Um, I was talking to him today ahead of this interview. Um, and one of the things that Oscar said to me that I thought was important to pass on was that when you have a good idea, you need to just start where you are. You don't really need a lot of fancy kit. As you can see in this photo, one of our early samples, Oscar's actually sketching out panel shapes just with a pencil, a bit of paper and some tape. Um, it would be lovely to have access to a really big, shiny R&D facility, but the reality is most people just don't have that. Um, so if you've got a really good idea, you need to start where you are. Oscar said that the first sample he made for uh, what would eventually become a Timo life jacket was made out of a cut up t-shirt with some cardboard held together with hot glue and uh, obviously did not look at all like a life jacket, um, but it was just him iterating and exploring. And every time you make one of those samples that looks a little bit chunky, you learn a little bit more and the next one you make is just a little bit better. So we think we made around 50 variations before we had a life jacket that could even be sent off for testing to kind of give you an idea. It took a long time. It wasn't something that happened overnight. Um, so don't worry if your first prototypes look a little bit weird or very homemade. They nearly always do. The point is just to keep moving forwards and solving one problem at a time and then the next one and then the next one. So for Timo, the problem was, um, how do you create a movable point on a life jacket that can also be load bearing? 
um, we had to know for sure that the harness point, um, when it moved to its secondary position, which was going to be behind the user and turn them face up, that it would still reliably do all the things it needed to do and take your body weight. It had to perform in extreme weather conditions. So Oscar looked for inspiration um, outside of sailing and um, he considered everything from parachute technology um, through to other sports where you might have load bearing kit. And uh, also as we made more samples, he actually started jumping into water in his own homemade uh, life jackets and dad and I would tow him up and down the Solent and just to see if Facto was really working and if it was going to do what we were expecting it to do. Um, we did this at all times of the year. Oscar's jumped in wearing Facto life jackets more than anybody else. Um, and he's done it in summer. Unfortunately for him, we've done it in winter. Um, I've got some photographs where he's practically blue because he's so cold. But every time we did it, we were learning something slightly different um, about that version. So, I think one of the things when you've got a good business idea or you think you've got a good idea is to try and test it safely as early as you can. You, you need to kind of do that background homework and really understand how your product's supposed to work and, and any shortcomings it might have. So by early 2013, so this is about two years in already, um, we knew we had a product coming along and that we thought was we'd be able to start selling any week now. And so optimistically, we booked a stand at Southampton Boat Show. And we created some leaflets explaining what Bacto was. And we trotted along, bright eyed, ready to sort of meet the world. And it was a really interesting experience. We went knowing that we weren't going to be selling any product. It was more about product research for us um, and start telling people about why Bacto is important. And generally people were quite polite. Um, some of them remembered the Morgan Cup accident or even had a personal connection to it. So there was some understanding, but this was completely new. It, was, it wasn't really a problem that people were aware of. Um, and we didn't obviously have a certified product to sell. So although Oscar's wearing one of our samples in this picture, um, we weren't handing over stock. What we were doing was we were gathering a really strong email list of people who were interested and some people who wanted to place pre-orders and we also ended up meeting quite a few yachting journalists who were visiting the show who went on to write articles um, saying what a good idea they thought this was and also quite a few people saying i can't believe no one's thought of doing this before so although i'm not sure by the end of the show, we were in quite a good position, but I'm not sure if you would necessarily say that it, it was it was not a normal boat show. Most people go to boat shows either expecting to buy or they're selling something. And for us, it was a real fact gathering mission, meeting as many sailors as we could in a short period of time. And after, as a result of the show and some of the articles that came out about us, we suddenly found Bacto being uh, nominated and winning a couple of quite cool design awards. So Oscar was actually shortlisted for the Dyson Award, which got him onto the Alan Titchmarsh live Saturday night show, which was very strange to watch, telling the nation about the life jacket design. And it was also nominated for a Dame Award, which if you're in the industry as we all are, that's obviously kind of a designer's dream to be nominated for, for an award like that. So we knew we were onto something, we just kind of had to figure out the details of how we were going to do it. The next step for us was to get our ISO approvals. So this was essential because it would mean we'd been independently tested and approved and would allow us to go and sell to the public. ISO is something that a lot of sailors are taught to look for when they're buying a life jacket. So it was absolutely critical for us to be able to launch the business. Um, this was probably the hardest and continues to be uh, one of the hardest parts of our business experience so far. To get an ISO certificate, you send about 20 samples of your product off to the test facility. You make these lovely samples, you box them up lovingly, you send them off, and then two months later, you get a great big box of rags back again. And um, the ISO team, they will test your product to beyond breaking point. And that's, that's kind of the point. You need to know that it's going to perform properly. So some of the things that they'll do for a life jacket, um, this could include pressure testing. 
load testing, uh, fire and wear testing. They've got um, a weathering machine where you put your life jacket in the machine and it artificially simulates extreme weather conditions, um, taking it down to about minus 60 and 60 degrees up. And after your life jacket has done a month in this machine, it then is put through all of the same inflation tests and that kind of thing to make sure that it still performs after all of that exposure. So it, it's really quite brutal. And it's normal um, for samples to fail in this testing round sometimes. Um, and that was our experience as well. We got into a pattern where we had the sending samples um, and then one part of it wouldn't, wouldn't pass. Um, and failing a test like that is obviously very expensive. It's expensive to do the test in the first place. And if you need to repeat it, you know, that's not something you want, you want to be doing. Um, we were on a tight budget and we were up against the clock to get our ISO certificate sorted so that we could start selling as quickly as possible. So Oscar would take the ISO test results, uh, look at the problems that had been identified in that test, and then immediately start trying to figure out um, how the design could be re-engineered to solve that issue. Um, a good company or a more established company would probably have a more thorough R&D process in place and actually one of the things that Oscar and I uh, realized later on was that it was mostly our own experience that led to these early test product test failures. Um, today before we send a product off to the test house we do a lot of in-house testing and um, over time we've built up the, the kind of tools that we've got ourselves and we can simulate a lot of the tests that we know the ISO body are going to apply to the product. Um, and you save yourself a lot of time, money, and kind of nasty surprises that way. If you can um, anticipate the, the areas of the product that you need to upgrade. But back in the early days, we, we didn't know that. Um, and so some of our testing experiments were just our learning as well about how the system worked and really what the test uh, house was looking for to make a reliable product. So it took us about two years to get ISO certified in the end. It was quite a long time. Um, by that point, we were really um, desperate to get the certificate. We had identified um, a factory who said that they could make the life jacket for us. And so whilst the ISO process was kind of slowly wearing on, um, we started sampling life jackets with this factory, hoping that with um, some good luck and a bit of timing, we could get production ready stock available as soon as the ISO certificate was confirmed. So we took a large chunk of our remaining savings um, and we put a production order in. Um, and the ISO certificate was granted, which should have been a day of huge celebration, but actually it was a bit more of a muted hurrah, really. We were so desperate to get stock in and to get selling. And um, it looked like it was all coming together in July of 2016. So we opened the first boxes from the, from the factory and every single life jacket was wrong. So I was going to call this slide, um, if you can't love your product, then you shouldn't make it. But the truth is, if you invent a product, there are going to be some days where you're absolutely going to hate it. Um, it seems to be an inevitable part of the journey, but the mark of a great idea and a great product is on those days that are just too awful to talk about. You take yourself home, have a hot bath, probably bend your partner's ear about it, and then come back again tomorrow and, and tackle it. So the problem with the first production run that had turned up from our production partner was a life jacket's made out of layers of fabric. Um, and those layers are load bearing, it means that you can rely on it to take your body weight. If you fall against your safety tether, your life jacket isn't gonna just shred and rip in half. It's gonna withstand the shock. And what had happened somehow along the way was a key panel of fabric had been missed out of the life jacket. Um, and we, we realized this because the first thing we did when we opened the boxes of this product was we cut one in half just to make sure that the construction was right. And it was, it was obvious straight away. Um, and there was really nothing that we could do about it. There's, there's no way you can repair that. All we could do was return the stock to the factory um, and tell our customers that actually, sorry, we weren't gonna be able to fulfill their orders straight away. Um, there's no real way to dress it up. It was a complete disaster. Uh, we were really low on funds at this point. 
we were going to miss the UK sailing season, which is really your prime selling season if you're a life jacket business. Um, and we didn't have time for replacement stock to, to reach us. So what did we do about it? I think it was kind of at this moment that being a family business probably really saved us. Um, I've spoken to other business co-founders before and they've said a similar thing. I think whether you've started business with a friend or a mentor or your family as well, um, when the shit hits the van, and it will at some point when you're starting a business, uh, you really need people who've got your back and who share the vision that you, you're all pulling in the same direction um, and you're there to pick it up. This was really quite a dark time for Timo. Um, and we decided that the best solution to prevent this happening again was we were going to open a UK manufacturing location of our own. Um, we found somebody who was selling the right kind of tools and the sewing machines that we needed locally. And um, we started looking around for talented seamstresses and sewers in the Southampton area. So there aren't actually that many businesses in Southampton that are making product from scratch these days. Uh, the city's got this incredible history of uh, manufacturing, obviously the shipyard, shipbuilding side of the industry, uh, lots and lots of sale lofts in kind of pre past times. And that's really all gone now. It's, it's a difficult place to start a manufacturing business. And there, is, there are still people doing it, but you know, few and far between. And so as we were recruiting for people to join our little team, uh, we really struggled to find people with, with the right skills. Um, we knew that we needed someone who had more experience than us, who would be able to give us good advice um, and who would be able to help us improve our production processes ourselves as we put them in place. We recruited Jill and Lou who are in the photograph here. They have been with us now for a good couple of years and we've got other people as well. Uh, I just didn't have a team photo of everybody um, to hand today. But we, we kind of got going. We, we moved offices at this point. This was in our new office. We were very proud of the sticker in reception here. Um, we had started on Town Quay in Southampton, really close to the Red Jet Terminal. We found a new, new space in Wollstone, just on the other side of the Itchen Bridge, which is where we put our sewing machines, built our work benches, um, and we started to make life jackets. And at this point, we were probably turning out um, half a dozen life jackets a week. It was really very, very little. The good news was loads of people were phoning the office, emailing the office, and they really wanted to buy the product. So we still knew that if we could make this, we would definitely be able to sell it. Um, and kind of having that um, affirmation there really kept us going on the days where we knew that we just couldn't keep up with demand and it seemed really difficult we had to figure our way out of this, this problem. Um, financially, at, to this point, we were, we were really low on cash. Um, we spent a lot of money developing the product. And so we had begged, borrowed and stealed from friends and family, uh, asking everybody to help support us. And we realized that um, we just were not going to be able to do it without outside help. We looked around, there's lots of options available to businesses. And like bank loans and that kind of thing. And we did our homework and we decided quite quickly that crowdfunding was probably the right way for us to go. Um, it's quite popular these days. There's more businesses doing it. Quite a few marine businesses as well have done high profile crowd crowdfunding, excuse me, um, campaigns. And so we decided we were going to go down this route as well. We used Crowdcube. There's a whole bunch of different providers. There's Cedars and Kickstarter, but we decided Crowdcube was right. And we were going to give away a stake in our business in return for investment that would allow us to then grow. We were aiming to raise 245,000 pounds and we actually ended up overfunding. So it took us about 10 days, but we closed the round on 270,000 pounds instead and just under 200 investors decided that they believed in our idea enough that they wanted to put their money into the business. And that was a really incredible moment, passing some of the milestones in Crowdcube um, as you sort of raise the first 20,000 pounds and then 50 and then 100. And you just think, wow, all these people really believe in us enough that, they, that they're prepared to, to make an investment in our little business. And that's a really cool feeling. 
And we also ended up meeting a lot of people that we just wouldn't have met any other way and who had their own business experiences, who ended up becoming mentors to Oscar and I in the business process. Uh, a lot of the time we know, you know, Oscar was 20 really when he started this and I was 26. We were quite young. We knew there was a lot that we didn't know. And having business mentors who were a lot more experienced and had been through the process a couple of times themselves was really invalu invaluable. They couldn't give us technical advice about how to make a life jacket, but they could give us advice on, have you thought about this? Have you pre-planned anything in this area? And I would really advise anybody who does go down the crowdfunding route, if you end up with investors in your business, look at their experience as well and just uh, see how their advice might apply to you. Um, they also actually got us to up our game um, in terms of putting some of the legal um, fences in place that we just hadn't thought about before. So one example that immediately springs to mind is we'd spent uh, a lot of our money up front getting the Bacto life jacket patented um, because we realized that this was something that was completely new. Um, but we hadn't actually trademarked our product name. So Bacto technology, for example, is one of a number of phrases that we trademark now that sits um, underneath Timo's uh, ownership. And our investors were able to say to us, look, that's something that's got value. Have you thought about protecting yourselves properly? Um, and that's the kind of advice that an investor could give you that you could either not learn until much later or learn the hard way if you ended up in a, you know, either a patent challenge or a court case regarding a product name. Uh, one thing that I would just drop in is that if you decide to trademark something, a lot of people will tell you that you need a trademark lawyer to help you do it. That wasn't our experience because we just didn't have the funds available at the time to spend more money with our lawyer. We'd already spent a huge chunk with them. Um, we decided to get the, the trademark ourselves. If you go through the government website, uh, there's loads of information. It's actually not that difficult. Um, and I think that starting this business has definitely taught both Oscar and I that with a lot of research, you can tackle a lot of things. So if you're, sh you're short on funds or long on time, short on cash, which is the position of a lot of startups, uh, you can probably find the answer yourself and make just as good a go at it as a professional um, in the early days when you can't afford to outsource stuff. Oh, let me just see if I can move my screen. There. So this photograph just shows you um, our UK production getting underway. At this point, we were still sort of doing everything ourselves. Um, Oscar built the workbenches. Um, Lou and Jill were giving us advice on the, the kind of walking foot that they needed for their sewing machine for different parts of the production process. Um, but the great thing was that we were able to bring our quality control in-house. So we are now doing smaller batch production than we might do if we partnered with a bigger factory. But every single step is carefully checked. Nothing leaves Timo that we're not 100% confident in. And it's always been like that since we very first started putting life jackets out to customers. And um, it's an absolute hallmark for us. We know that life jackets made by us are going to be worn by customers in some really hostile environments. Um, a friend of mine sent me a photograph from the Sydney Hobart of him and his team screaming downwind in 40 knots, all of them wearing Timos. And, uh, and that is, it's a cool feeling because I absolutely love it when we see customers out there, um, you know, really pushing the envelope. They're doing what they love. We love sailing as well. Uh, but it also makes you think, oh, wow, that's quite a responsibility, you know, that life jacket. <laughs> uh, that has really, really got to perform. And UK production has allowed us to really step that up. Um, and we are constantly checking everything that we do. Um, one of the things that I should just mention here is that we are still a small team. Um, but one of the things that we are looking to do is we're looking to recruit a general manager at our um, for our site in Wollstone. So I mentioned to Zella and the others that I was going to drop this in here. I, uh, I'm just going to say that is we're growing, the team is growing. We've actually had a really great year despite COVID and, and all that kind of stuff. And we know that people are desperate to get out on the water. So we're making life jackets as quickly as we can. And uh, we need somebody to come in and, and help us uh, onto the next, next step. So if anyone's listening who's looking for a job, please let me know. <laughs> Um, in 2019, we had a really lovely experience when uh, the British Marine Federation 
jointly awarded Oscar and I the Young Business Person of the Year Award. Um, this was in recognition of everything we had done to that point. Um, and it's something, an award that we really felt was shared across the whole team, not just the two of us. It really has been a, a huge team effort to get Timo to the point that it's at today. Um, and Oscar and I were really flattered to be given the award. It, it was a real sort of public recognition um, of all the hard work that was going on behind the scenes. Um, the kind of famous duck analogy could probably be to fit in here. It might look quite um, put together and glossy on the surface, but in reality, you are paddling like crazy under the water to keep everything together. Um, and it's, it's definitely something that we couldn't do without Jill Lou and everybody else at Timo. And awards are a really lovely thing. They kind of show that you're on the right path and people are recognizing what you're trying to do. Uh, but I think it's important to kind of not get carried away with them and to keep evolving, to keep thinking about where your product is and how you can improve it. In 2019, we started having a conversation with a, a really big sailing apparel company who wanted to do their own life jacket. Um, and we ended up in a, a licensing conversation that went a really long way. Um, and it, whilst it didn't happen at the, at the last minute, it, was, it really kind of opened up a new conversation for us where it's something that we knew other brands were looking at um, and they were interested to be able to include Bacto in their life jacket ranges. Um, but their feedback to us allowed us to um, iterate and improve what we were actually offering ourselves as well. So one of their bits of feedback was, is it simple enough? Do people intuitively understand how the Bacto system, the unique patented bit, do they really understand how that works? You can see on the sample life jacket here, um, there's a series of metal rings on the waist belt of the life jacket. Um, and this is the bit that I sort of described as being like parachute technology earlier. As a result of the licensing conversation we had, Oscar actually came up with an idea of a way to simplify this. Um, and so we actually changed it in our own range. And this is now what we can call the Mark One, and we've got the Mark Two already available, which we've been selling for about 18 months to customers, um, where you've got an improved, simplified, lighter weight, easier to rearm, um, facto system. And that really came about as a result of these conversations with um, an associated brand. So I think it's really important, even when you have got your product on the market, to know that um, that there's always ways to refine it and to keep looking at how it's being used and what your customers are telling you about your product. One of the great things actually about running your own manufacturing uh, production line is that you can pivot quite quickly. With a life jacket, you're quite bound by your ISO certificate. You've got to make everything to the signed off technical file. But if your customers are giving you small bits of feedback um, that can be included in your product without retesting requirements, then you can do that. If you were working with a big manufacturing partner, you'd have to plan it months in advance or even a year, you know, to get into the production cycle. Whereas when you're making it yourself, you've really got a lot more autonomy to say, yeah, do you want a, a hanging loop in the back of the neck or do you want an extra name tap, uh, name tape, sorry, sewn inside the waist belt? We can do that. And you can implement those things and keep making your product better and better. And then something else happened in 2019. We sort of had the ultimate VIP endorsement when the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge chose Timo Life Jackets for the King's Cup Regatta that took place in the Solent in, in August 2019. And I really included it here, uh, not as a boast, but more to the point, this was a huge team morale booster for Timo. Um, everybody from the Oscar and I at the top to every to oh, we had interns and people who were helping out on us production assistants at that point. We really felt a sense of pride and ownership when you see somebody very high profile like this wearing your product. Um, and we had this very strange week where uh, we'd go to the supermarket to buy lunch and you'd see a copy of Hello magazine and Kate uh, Duchess of Cambridge was on the front wearing a Timo and you think my goodness. That's my product. We made that in Wollstone, you know, and uh, that was really such a bizarre feeling. Uh, but it really kind of hammered home the message to all of us about, well, this is why we're doing it. Not to get the royals wearing our life jackets, but to get life jackets to make safety products that is really high quality, that can 
perform in any conditions um, and can be chosen, chosen by people at the top of the sport. And as a result of the royals wearing the life jacket, there was quite a lot of press, as I mentioned. You were kind of seeing it on the newsstands and in a lot of the glossy magazines in the couple of weeks after the regatta happened. And um, one of the things that we really realized was good press doesn't necessarily help your sales. <laughs> if you are selling a, a niche product like a life jacket, and I would say that a lot of different products that are produced by the marine industry are niche, even if somebody's super high profile, wears your, uses your product um, and is captured on camera doing that, you're not necessarily going to see uh, an uptick in sales. And doing something just for fame and glory is not the reason that Oscar and I got into this business. The purpose of your business is absolutely key. If your idea is a good idea, it's because it's changing the world for everybody, not just because you want to get in front of a camera or because you're hoping for some really lovely press. Um, press is good, but it's, it's not the be all and end all. I think that um, if, you've, if you've got a good idea, it's good to be quite critical about it in the early days. Um, and if you do get some of the kind of glossy top level stuff, like lots of press coverage, don't let it go to your head. Uh, the aim always with a product is for it to be useful, not for it to be cool. And after late 2019, we teamed up with Tracy Edwards and she just relaunched the Maiden project at that point. And we wanted to get our Timo life jackets going across oceans and to have people put them to the ultimate test and wear them in lots of different conditions, more conditions than we could just have access to sailing off the Isle of Wight where, we, where we're based. Um, and we were really proud to team up with Tracy and her team. Um, her team went left handle and they did their circumnavigation. And when your customers are wearing your life jackets going across the Pacific or through the Southern Ocean, uh, you know, you're kind of, you know, you're onto something, your products being worn in a whole variety of conditions. And we were then getting the life jackets back, checking them, seeing where they were wearing. It led to a lot of product improvements um, and sort of little tweaks that have ultimately resulted in a much better product for us. Um, and you might also recognize these guys. This is Dan and Kika from Sailing Uma on YouTube, um, the kind of sailing royalty. So our second, second set of royalty wearing Timo life jackets. Um, the reason I'm including them here is I think that some marine businesses think that mainstream media and social media isn't necessarily the way to communicate to their customers, that because we are um, niche compared to other industries, that somehow it's not for marine businesses um, and actually when Dan and Kika they bought Timo life jackets Oscar and I um, were not previously followers of their channel um, and they they bought them and they decided to independently review them and make a video um, about their feedback about the life jacket and uh, their story the, because they're fantastic storytellers these guys um, really resonated with a whole new part of the sailing world that we were not in touch with ourselves and they then did a second video where they visited Timo's um, office in Southampton and they did a walk around and they saw the team and they talked to us about our design process. And I, I think that when you have a really strong purpose and when you've got a really clear idea and product that you're offering to people, um, when you're talking directly to your customer, they're always going to be interested in the story behind your business. And one thing I would say is if you're thinking about taking a product and turning it into a business, tell your story to people directly, honestly, um, just, just kind of get it out there because someone will find it interesting. If somebody's into sailing, Dan and Kika as an example are really into knowing how products work. They've also got an electric engine they've reviewed, that they've reviewed on their channel. They review lots of different elements, technical elements of sailing and so for them it was a perfect fit to really get down to the nitty gritty of how their life jacket worked and um, it's it's a very specific story that you're only going to be interested in if you are a sailor or maybe you're doing some research on buying a life jacket for yourself or your crew and um, but my point here is if you have a good idea and you have a really clear purpose and you can communicate that to other people who've got a voice and they're storytellers themselves they will amplify that 
and really help take your little idea, your product, um, where you, you're, you're, you're operating with your own network um, and they can just tell the whole world about that uh, and get straight to the people who actually matter. So when the Duchess, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge wore our life jacket, we were on the front of Hello, we were on the front of all of the major newspapers, how wonderful, it was a huge ego stroke, but it actually didn't help us connect to our customer. It didn't help us sell more. It didn't help us tell people about the technology that was actually inside the life jacket. When you connect with people who are uh, that kind of conduit between your business and your customer, they really put into words why it was important for us to bring this piece of technology to market. You know, that we were doing it because we wanted to improve life jacket standards that we weren't in it just to build a business and flip it and sell it for money, that we were here because we we're passionate about life jackets, how they work and how they save lives um, in practical sense. So that just brings me to my wrap up. I didn't actually know the source of this quote and I found out this morning that it was Jay-Z, which is not really my usual business hero. <laughs> but um, the thing is, if you have a really strong idea and a driving passion um, that you've got an idea for a product that you think could be a commercial business there are going to be some really hard times and you're going to learn a lot along the way uh, where you might look back and think god i really could have shortcut straight to the end goal here if only i would known x but you have to learn at your own rate and you have to have a team around you who are with you for the long haul um, who are going to stick by you even in the really difficult days or pick you up if you're having a bad day and maybe they're not quite in such a dark place as you are. It is never easy, but often small businesses are the ones who are innovating at the edges. That you, When you are the small guy, you see opportunities, you can do things that the big businesses can't. You have a unique opportunity to bring something new to the world and to tell people, hey, this is important. Uh, it might never have been done before, but that might just be because nobody's thought of it. It doesn't, you know, translate that the guys who are at the top of the, the market for your sector know everything. They might have missed something really, really important. And I would always say to people to give it a go and, uh, you know, ask questions from people who've been there ahead of you as well and, and share your ideas and get it out there because it's important. And I think that is my last slide. That was absolutely fascinating. Really, really interesting. Thank you so much, Lauren. I'm sure that everybody was as glued to your story as I was. So we've just got time for a couple of questions. Well, you just kind of, I'll read out this question that we've got in the chat while you just take a break for one second. Um, I'd just like to say to everyone, I don't know, but you could raise your hands if like me, you agree that it's so lovely to see a presentation with slides and not somebody just reading out of paragraphs. Oh, I'm all for that. So that was brilliant. So one of the questions that's come in is from Haley, and she says, the story sounds like one of the team, one of teamwork to me. Do you think either one of you would have run with the idea on your own or was it a combination of your family skills that made this happen? And I'd also just like to add on um, the end of that question as well, Lauren. So it's three questions in one, lucky you, is would Oscar wear your life jacket all the way across the ocean now? So there we go. <laughs> Yes, he definitely would. In fact, I know he would love uh, in the next couple of years to take a sabbatical and do some serious offshore miles himself again, and he would definitely wear a team over that. Um, I, I don't think that we had, um, we are a family of sailors and we have very different skills. So for instance, Oscar is a phenomenal product designer, um, but he is less interested in the storytelling side of the business and I'm the exact opposite I really can't design anything to save my life but I am really interested in talking to our customers finding out what they're doing where they're going and which life jacket is right for them and we're slowly building the range out so it's not just for offshore sailors anymore we've also got inshore options and other things so I love um, talking to customers and I think that whoever's on your team you need to recognize your own weaknesses as early as possible and essentially design them out um oscar and i are quite happy to admit each other's weaknesses to each other as brother and sister and in fact we often remind each other of them but we um we kind of complement each other's um flaws and strengths and there's no shame in that you know i i think that's the important part of, of building a team 
um, is making sure that you've got people who can kind of round the whole lot out. Absolutely. Okay, we've got another couple of questions come in, which is brilliant. Um, uh, lots of people saying, well done, outstanding. Um, question from Sharon. Clearly the accident has identified a flaw in the safety products we have, rare though it may be. Do you believe that the ISO regs should be updated to reflect this, or at least the safety recommendations within racing, where argu arguably the boats are moving faster and more risks are taken, etc.? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think that the ISO standards develop over time, often in response to real life uh, events and accidents in exactly the way this happened. And in the past, boats just weren't doing the speeds uh, that we can achieve today. You know, racer cruisers and cruising boats are moving a lot faster than they did 10, 15, 20 years ago. So um, the fact that life jacket technology hadn't evolved to keep up with it is why we started this business. Uh, we definitely think that there is always scope for the standards to be updated, reviewed, to make sure that they are still fit for purpose. And that is a quite long-winded process. It's not something you can just do um, with, a, with a click of your fingers, unfortunately. So I hope in time we, we will see, uh, see, see a movable harness point um, becoming something that is recommended by race organizers because we just recognize that it's, it's something that's really important for sailors. Thank you, brilliant. So Lucy asks, do you have any tips for surviving financially through the early years when prototyping and testing takes longer than planned and you're not at the stage to sell equity? Yeah, um, that's a really difficult one because it is, it is quite situational. I mean, Oscar and I both put our personal savings into the business to get it started. I have spoken to other business owners in completely different fields who've told me about some of the incredibly creative ways they've managed to keep going um, when funds were tight. Lots of people obviously start their business as a, a side hustle and will work a full-time job and develop uh, their project, their passion project in the evening. And I, I would suggest that that's something that most people should do. You can get a long way down the sampling process before you start trying to pull salaries out of your business. It was actually, that is exactly what Oscar and I did. Um, we were not taking a salary from Timo for the longest time and um, I mean some of the things I've been told by other business owners my favorite one probably was um, a girl who runs a very successful um, chain of, of uh, beautician spas in London um, and she realized that she um, didn't have she didn't have enough funds to cover her next payroll so to get around it she threw a huge house party and charged everybody 20 pounds to come in and that's how she then funded her next month's payroll and uh, so you know you can get really creative but I don't recommend it I would recommend trying to stay um, with a with a salaried position and working on it until your business is strong enough. Okay, and we've got um, just time for one last question before we've just got a couple of housekeeping notices. So Norman asks, how does your relationship with your 200 crowdfunders work? Um, so we, we our, our investors had to, uh, could choose how much they wanted to invest in the business. Um, and so we have what we can call a top level investor who invested more than 3000 pounds and anybody less than that is still a very valued investor, but we talk to them less uh, directly. We stay in touch with everybody by email and we send out quarterly updates. Um, they get special kind of behind the scenes peeks at what's going on in business. Um, and then we also talk uh, directly to as many people as possible. So anytime any of our investors can email us um, and say what's going on with this or how are things going. Last year in particular, we heard from people a lot, obviously, because they wanted to know what was going on during COVID um, and, and how the business was positioned. And we'll always get back to people um, or try and talk to them directly on the phone. Um, so I, I think that the more you can involve your investors, the better. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lauren. That was just fabulous. I've really, really enjoyed that. And I'm sure everybody else has as well. So just a couple of quick housekeeping bits and pieces. Um, Lauren's really happy to answer any more questions that anybody might have. So she said you can contact her via her Team O Marine social media um, channels, which are available on all platforms. So don't forget also that this is only the first of our Women in Marine sessions. So do keep an eye out on Marine Industry News for other ones that we've got coming up and watch out for the recording of today with all our mugs on um, our channels, which we'll be putting out in the near future. Um, Suzanne's just going to say a quick word to us again, our lovely sponsor, and then we'll just come back to me and then we'll be done. So off you go, Suzanne. 
Well, I couldn't be more proud to have sponsored this because Lauren, you are wise and inspiring and articulate and you tell the full story of manufacturing. It's not easy and I would agree with you. I've always said my only skill is pr preservation. And I think your final quote said it all when you just say you never give up, you just keep going. And um, I love the family aspect of your story. It was ex also inspiring. And I remember the accident that you talked about and it still puts a lump in our throats. So it was good to hear you say that something very good happened because of that because of that incident. And I also like the fact that you turned every incident that happened in manufacturing, any failure you turned into a success story. And that happens all the time with us. And we know that in the long, long term uh, design process and testing process seems endless. But when you get there, you're glad <laughs> you try to celebrate, you're really just, happy that you got there. And so I just appreciated so much hearing that real true whole story. So thank you for that. And thank all of you for coming to this event and keep, out, keep an eye out for all the women in marine events because we hope that, um, you know, we want women, we want everybody, but we want especially to have women have the chance to meet each other and talk to each other and see each other. That's it. That's brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Suzanne. So that just leaves me to thank you all again for coming. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for the sponsorship. It was awesome. Thank you to the Minty. Thanks to Lauren. That was brilliant. And um, we look forward to seeing you again. And don't forget, your key rings should be in your mugs as well. I forgot to mention those earlier. I absolutely adore playing with mine. I haven't got the keys on it yet, but I'm having a grand time. So thanks very much for coming again. And we're just going to close the meeting down in about 30 seconds. So send us any feedback you have. Lovely to see you all. It's been awesome. Cheerio. Thank you.